can put electrical tape around things. So, so bear with me when you see this stuff. If anyone wants to look at any of this junk that I'm going to be showing you after we're done, uh, I'd love to show it to you. I'd love to let you get hands on. In fact, I brought a bunch of extra stuff with me. So if anyone's interested in things like photoreceptors, solar cells, stuff like that, I'd be happy to gift you some of that stuff. Okay. So, and if I don't have it on me, I have a bunch of stuff in my house that I'd be happy to gift you. I could send it to you in the mail, whatever. <laughs> okay. So with that, um, the concept of modulated light. Now, Let's see a raise of hands really quick. I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but does anyone in here know what, what light modulation is before we continue? Sort of? Okay. This is a very fundamental idea, and I'm going to first start talking about laser listening devices, and then I'm going to move on to something called the photophone, which is a historic invention from the 1880s that Alexander Graham Bell found. Okay, But the idea behind the photophone and the idea behind laser listening devices, it's the same idea. The idea being that if you take a source of light, such as a laser pointer, and you hit something like a window with it, or a car window, or even a painting on the wall, okay, that laser, that laser is going to bounce off. You're going to catch it with a photoreceptor. And what happens in this scenario is that if there's somebody, if there's somebody or an audio source behind this pane of glass, they're vibrating the pane of glass with their voice, okay? So the laser, when it hits the pane of glass, is going to be modulated with that vibration. So what happens is you've got a, a laser beam hits the window, it gets modulated with the audio behind the glass, goes into a photoreception device. The photoreceptor then turns that light, that modulated light, back into electrical signal, at which point you're actually capturing the audio that's happening behind that, that vibrating glass source remotely, okay? Um, very fundamental idea. And if you understand this idea, then this whole talk will make sense to you and hopefully you'll find it interesting. Uh, here's, a, here's a classic. If you're interested in laser listening devices, this is a classic cartoon that you can find all over online uh, showing the two spy guys, right, who are listening to some businessman across the way in downtown Manhattan or something. Okay. Um, laser listening devices, you can roll your own. It's cake. It actually is really cake to do this. This is stuff that I've built by hand. You can go out and buy a laser pointer, take it apart, take the batteries out of it, hook some bigger batteries to it so that when you set it running on a tripod, it'll run, let's say, all day long. Um, and photo so that's a photoresistor, and that photoresistor comes from Radio Shack. Uh, you can long live Radio Shack. I love Radio Shack, and I'm very sad to see it going uh, because one of the only places you can, yes. Exactly. One of the only places you can still go get stuff like photoresistors, Radio Shack. And little amplifiers and kits and the things that you need to do work like this, Radio Shack. So we're lucky enough to have a good one still in East Greenbush. And I've been exploiting my, my opportunity there. Anyway, photoresistors, laser pointers, okay? You can build this stuff on your own, as I said. Or you can go commercial. You can buy commercial stuff. Um, you can buy kits like this, you know, if you're the CIA or NSA or something, or you're an FBI guy, uh, and you have a $10,000 budget, you can buy a laser listening kit. Um, and there's a, they, they vary in quality and so forth, but, you know, this stuff is totally hardcore, very, very expensive. I can't afford any of it. Um, and most lasers that are used in this capacity to spy on people remotely um, are infrared, so that the person who's actually being surveilled is totally unaware of the fact that their windows are being hit by a laser. Okay. Um, now, before I go any further, you might be asking yourself, does this work? Do these methodologies work? Yes, totally. I've spied on my own family 20 times using this stuff that, I, that I've built. Okay, This totally works. It's awesome. In fact, the fidelity level of laser-based microphones is very, very high. So you can often get really clear audio behind a window, really clear audio off of a painting if you're bouncing an infrared laser off of a paint or a painting with glass, of course. Um, the stuff I'm going to show you coming up here, the fidelity is much lower. Because, as you can imagine, I'm going to be talking about ambient light and reflected light in, in normal conditions, right? So the fidelity is much lower. Oh, also, you have to be very careful not to melt your face with infrared lasers because we as humans can't, we're not going to react to something that we can't see, right? So you can actually, like, blow your eye out with an infrared laser. Um, in fact, I wanted to point out, so recently, I one of my eyes occluded 
I had a, uh, it's called a young person's cataract. My right eye went, whoop, in a period of two months. It went totally cloudy. So I went to the optician and I was like, what's going on with my eye, man? I can't see. I can't clear my eye out. And they're like, oh, you have a cataract, but only in your right eye. This didn't dawn on me until recently when I started putting this talk together that maybe I wailed myself with a, was a, with a laser too many times. <laughs> I don't know. Possibly. Anyway, they went in there and vacuumed it out and put a plastic lens in, so I'm all good. Um, Okay, so uh, why use infrared? Because if you're spying on somebody, you don't want them to know, obviously, right? So you're trying to be surreptitious. Infrared laser beams are underneath the, the detectable spectrum that the human eye can detect. So as you can imagine, I don't know if anyone in here is up to no good. Um, if you are, Godspeed, right? Good luck. But, um, you know, if the, if the feds are after you and they're spying on you with a laser listening device, it's going to be wicked, wicked hard to detect. Okay, so uh, just as an example of a, of a technology that is similar, at least in terms of uh, how it's used, anyone ever heard of the thing? Yes, cool. Okay, so the thing, the thing was an awesome thing that was delivered to the American Embassy in 1945 by a bunch of Soviet schoolchildren. Right, they marched up to the American Embassy because they were having some sort of meeting, and they brought this uh, giant wooden seal with them, and within the wooden seal. Uh, encased within it was a basically a passive uh, listening device that could only be de uh, activated via a certain radio frequency um, from outside of the building. Okay, of course the Russians knew what this radio frequency was, and uh, interestingly, the person who invented this was uh, Leon Theremin. Anyone ever seen a theremin in use? Theremins are awesome. They're this musical device that depend on electrical fields, right? So the closer you get your hands, the weirder the sound it makes. Often, uh, you know, like like space invader type noises in movies are made by theremins. So same guy of of musical fame created the thing and uh, and was in charge of of uh, inventing this. So anyway, why do I point this out? Because the same communities that are doing things to them to each other, like the thing, are also the same communities who are shooting laser beams around and listening to each other and following cars and you name it. Okay, so uh, th this, is, this is actually pretty interesting to me. Uh, a laser listening device, a rangefinder that uses infrared lasers is nearly a complete laser listening device. All you have to do is take the output off the thing and hook a speaker to it and you've got a laser listening device. Now, how do they bounce an infrared laser off of a remote target and get it back to the device itself? I have absolutely no idea, but it's awesome, okay? Uh, I don't know how they do it. I imagine, my, my assumption is that an infrared laser possibly leaves the center here and is maybe dispersed enough so that the chances are that it gets a, a scattered laser back. I don't know. If anyone knows, please let me know because I'm trying to figure it out. Um, either way, if you had a couple hundred bucks to spare, you could take one of these apart and try to make a laser listening device out of it. In fact, legend has it, I was told this year, years ago, that the Navy had a pair of binoculars that were laser listening binoculars. So they could stand on, stand on, uh, on board and find their target, right, let's say it's seven miles away, and target these binoculars on it, and they shot a laser out of one lens, and it came back into the other, and they could listen to what someone was saying on the, uh, um, what's, it, what's it called, where the captain sits? In the, in the captain's wheelhouse. Okay. So they, that, that's, that apparently, uh, is a thing. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about is something of great interest to me. The photophone. And remember the concept that I told you about in the very beginning where you bounce a laser off something that's vibrating? Photophone uses exactly the same concept. And Bell discovered this in 1880. And what he did was he used what was available to him, which was sunlight. Okay. So, he uh, created, this is the this is the descending aspect of the, the photophone. He'd take it out into a field, the sun would hit this mirror, it would go through a, a variety of different lenses uh, where it was concentrated into a more um, high energy beam, and then it hits a, uh, basically a cell here where he's got a reflective material that's prone to actually vibrating when he talks behind it. That reflective material then modulates the light, like we discussed, sends it across a field. It's then received by a photophone uh, receptor, okay? Same concept as a laser listening device. This is the receiver. 
So the receiver in Bell's case was a parabolic dish with reflective material, material on the inside of it. And he used an element called selenium. Selenium is sort of a precursor to solar cells. Selenium acts just like a solar cell. In fact, when light hits selenium, its resistance goes up and down in inverse with how much energy it's being exposed to. So as, as you can imagine, if you have an element who produces uh, more or less electricity according to how much light it's being exposed to, then you hit that with modulated light, it's going to produce electricity, you pipe that to a speaker, you're going to be able to hear what's being said on the remote side. Okay, so two examples of how we did it here. Interestingly, I'm going to show you how I do this. And um, I have something similar to this, to a battery bank, right? You hook a battery bank to this to boost what's going on, what's coming over the wire. In essence, you're amplifying, okay? And I'm going to show you some amplifiers. All right. Oh, I already explained selenium to you. So modern um, solar cells perform largely the same exact function, function as selenium. Um, I've got a couple with me. I'm going to show you some. In fact, I can pull a couple out right now. Ah, these are just junk solar cells that I've purchased off of Amazon, a couple bucks each. They have different wattages. Um, when I first started experimenting with this topic, I was operating under, I think, the false assumption that I had to buy really high quality stuff to use it to get the fidelity levels that I need. And in fact, that wasn't true. And I have found the opposite to be true. The cheaper junk that I've bought off Amazon, in fact, is better in this context. Um, I bought one relatively expensive solar cell, which I'll show to you. This guy. And yes, it works wonderfully. Okay. But it doesn't decode audio like the cheaper ones. Um, I think it's probably because it's prone to way more interference. It's got a larger field, right? So it's getting more ambient light, producing more electricity. So the smaller ones actually work better in this context. OK. Here's some basic photophone stuff. So can anyone deduce what this is, or what this is all about, what I'm trying to do with this? Anyone? What this is, and I'll show it to you in a second here, it's just a cheap cardboard cylinder, right, um, that I've hooked to the top of a, a flashlight. That cylinder, the top of it, has a 45 degree angle card. On the inside of the card, I've put reflective HVAC tape, okay? So the light comes off the, the flashlight, hits the reflective surface, and shoots out the front of the the flashlight, okay? So what I can do then with this rudimentary device is send Morse code to my friends, right? We're talking, this is like a 10-year-old's toy between houses in a city. I can shine a light over to them, and if they have a photoreceptor on their end, I can go tap, 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 and that audio is going to make it over to my, my buddy, okay? And I'll show this to you right now. Uh, Right. So that's it. Then if I tap on this, it modulates the audio. Okay. And I'll actually I'll show you a couple of audio examples of sending Morse remotely using this device in a few minutes. Okay. okay. So building a simple receiver, what's involved? Well, you need a solar cell to build a receiver. You need an amplifier, which I'll show you a couple. Um, you need a single uh, 0.1 capacitor to reduce the DC noise that's coming off of the solar panel that you're using, because solar panels are outputting electricity at all times, right? So you don't want that. It's just going to be noise. In fact, you'll hear some of the buzzing and whizzing and whirring that I'll, that in some of these audio samples. Um, you need either a microphone or a recorder. Uh, in its simplest form, you'd use a microphone and uh, some wire alligator clips, electrical tape, Radio Shack, again, is your friend. Okay, so amps. When I started out with research like this, 
What I did was I went to, again, I'm going to say Radio Shack probably 50 more times in this talk. Went to Radio Shack and I bought a bunch of um, LM386 amplifiers and started building things, building these things by hand. But keep in mind, I suck at uh, soldering. I suck at electronics. <laughs> I'm not a detail-oriented human being. So I found it very challenging to get these things to work properly, okay? But the idea is, is that once you build one of these, it has a standard in, it has a standard out. So you pipe the solar cell to the in on the card, right? And if you're not getting the results you need, you twist up this little dial and it increases the amplification, and then there you go. So this is this is one type of way that you can build your own amps for these solar environments. However, I have a better one. Oh, here it is. This is just a little commercial amp, this little white thing, and this performs dramatically better than anything I've built by hand, okay? So this is what I'm using in current experimentation. It's just this little tiny mini amplification speaker, which works perfectly for what I need. So if you have a chance, if you're interested in this kind of research, if you have a chance to pick up a little LM386 commercially produced amp, I would do that. Okay. Other details. Here's your uh, in-series uh, capacitor, right? The use of alligator clips. Um, and I have a digital voice recorder that I use for some of this stuff. Okay, so I'm going to demo uh, basically how audio can be uh, modulated into light for you. I'm just going to use a strobe effect on a uh, flashlight. So before I do that, does anybody have any problems with strobes? I know that like some people, epileptic people can be triggered by a strobe. I don't want to do it if there is anyone in the audience. No? Okay. So. <sighs> Hear that buzz? That's from the lights up above. So if you're ever wondering what the lights in this room sound like, that's what they sound like. <laughs> See the difference? Okay, so I'm actually I'm actually sending I would I would say null null encoded uh, modulated light into the cell into the cell right now. But if I change this to strobe, okay, so that's yes. So that's the idea. That idea, you exploit that idea. You can capture audio that's floating around all around us at any given time. Okay, so if, for instance, I were up near one of these these lights on the on the ceiling, and I was talking loudly enough, I'd actually be modulating that light, and I could catch it with a solar cell down here on the stage. Um, okay, so I'm going to play you an audio file now. One of the things that I try to avoid, I've had a, a spotty history with live demonstrations of things. I've had some things fail on me over the years, so I captured audio files ahead of time to show you how some of this works. One of the, one of the audio files is an example of using this little Morse encoder and what it sounds like on the solar side when you catch it. Okay, so let me find that and play it for you. Oh, I've got audio out. Hold on. Can you hear that? Yeah, okay. So that's what the, the Morse encoder sounds like. back in here. Okay, so the the real the million dollar question when it comes to um, photophone receivers is can you catch ambient light or sunlight or reflected sunlight or intentionally concentrated sunlight 
Can you catch it off of something that's reflective, and is it effectively encoding audio? That's the big question that I had, right? Because like I said, I'm a computer security guy, and what I'm primarily interested in is whether or not someone is surveilling me. If they are, how are they doing it, right? What's the threat? Not only that, but you know, I was a pen tester for 10 years, so whether or not light that's in the environment is encoding audio and whether or not there's juice to be stolen out of it is of great, great interest to me. So. This is an, is an experiment that was very simple to conduct. All I did was I took a picture frame, um, and I put a little bit of uh, HVAC reflective tape on it. And I'll explain what I consider to be a tape attack in a few minutes, OK? But reflective tape, this is just a very basic uh, photophone receiver on this end, configured just like I explained, into an amplifier and then into a digital recorder. Um, and then what I did was I played uh, in this room that we're looking at. I played Seven Nation Army, relatively loud, but loud enough to uh, vibrate the glass on this. And I wanted to give you a listen to this. This is kind of the crux of the matter. Can you catch encoded audio in reflected ambient light? We're about to find out. Let's see. Um, as I mentioned, compared to laser listening devices, the fidelity is very, very low. If you used a laser listening device in this capacity and you were bouncing it off of a window or a picture frame or whatever, in the vicinity of that song playing, the fidelity would be very, very high. You'd be like, oh, that's Seven Nation Army. I totally recognize it. Now, using ambient light that's reflected in these environments, it's much, much harder to get that level of quality that you need. But I would propose this. My proposal is, is that I have almost zero budget, right? This is like a hobby, hobby junk for me. I'm throwing maybe a hundred bucks at this topic. If you had, if you were some sort of federal government employee, you worked at the NSA, whatever, you had a couple hundred million dollars to spend, I can guarantee you they're producing passive solar arrays that can actually decode all kinds of fancy schmancy audio that's been modulated into it. All right. Continuing onward. Natural reflectors. This is what's really primarily interesting to me, is whether or not in the natural environment there are um, light beams that we can capture and analyze and try to pull audio out of. Uh, quite naturally, as you just saw, right, I can get audio out of reflected light. So I would assume that if there's somebody behind these windows right here yelling and screaming or playing loud music, that there'd be audio encoded in this that we could ultimately retrieve from this reflected light. Again, there. I'm sure we've all seen these funny articles that hit the scene where, uh, you know, buildings are melting cars because the sun is reflecting off of them and they're melting cars on the street. I can guarantee you if there's a good, if there's a strong audio source behind that, man, you'd be able to pull out all kinds of good modulated sound from that. Um, and I, I told you I was going to explain attacking with tape, right? So, uh, from a pen testing standpoint, I consider this more of an active attack. Rather than looking for, you know, serendipitous situations where I'm getting light reflected off of a building and I'm hoping that there's an audio source behind it, rather, I prefer the method of walking around with a, with a roll of HVAC tape and stick it to anything that's interesting to me, right? So, um, let's say I'm walking in downtown Albany and I walk past the lawyer's office who's involved in some lawsuit against me and I want to know what's going on behind that window, pull out the HVAC tape, right? Take a little piece of it off stick it to the window, and then, of course, if the sun reflects off of it, I can pull the audio out of it. That's the way I think. That's what's interesting to me is actually taking this attack into um, out, of the, out of the natural environment where you're dependent on natural conditions and more like making it something that you can actually manually conduct against somebody. Okay, so interesting examples of what's possible in this regard. Uh, this is the Australian Embassy in Washington, D.C., newly constructed, has a fully solar roof, right? 
<laughs> now, hopefully this has dawned on everybody that anything that's solar now is potentially a, a source of audio for us. So as a fully solar roof. Um, the environment in which I would imagine we could exploit this condition, let's say in an international espionage environment, would be if one embassy in, let's say, Prague was quite clearly located much lower than another another embassy, and the conditions were right for uh, sun to be reflected off of windows or whatever, and caught by the building that was lower down. Um, this is a very interesting thing that's happening here in uh, Rukan, Norway, where there's a village in Norway that's within a very, very deep valley. And in the winter, the sun never makes it down into the village. So they go six months, eight months out of the year without any natural sunlight. So what they've done in this, in this situation is they've set up uh, sun reflectors up on the top of the mountains in various different places so that when the sun rises, they catch the reflection and they're creating an artificial sun down in the center square. Okay, so as you can imagine, if you're using technology like this, reflective technology, and you have the wherewithal and the means, let's say you're working in an embassy or something, you could set up something where you're hitting another building or hitting a window with a sunlight beam, just like Bell did. And this concept is called heliostats. So this is called the date or the sunflower. Uh, you can buy these people who you know need sun in a certain room in their house. They have a dark room in back. They can buy themselves a heliostat and use it in this way to actually get natural light into certain rooms. So from my perspective, I'd love a heliostat, right? Because I'd carry it around with me and actually try to bounce sun off buildings and see what I could capture. Okay, so <laughs> remember, remember when we talked about surreptitious attacks, right? Why would somebody use an infrared laser? Well, it's because they're probably the feds and they're out to get you, right? They want to throw you in jail, so they're going to use an infrared laser um, to avoid detection. The, the, the situation with ambient reflected light is very interesting because it's almost the converse of someone taking the time to use an infrared laser so that it evades detection because the sun and ambient light is so ubiquitous in our daily lives, no one pays attention to it. Right? No one thinks about it. So, uh, And I'm going to show you a cool example of some technology coming up here in a minute. But it's so, it's so everywhere. It's not seeing the forest for the trees, right? I'm sure you've all heard that, that term before, not seeing the forest for the trees. So the threat is everywhere. Uh, at least the threat is everywhere for the attacker who has enough money to exploit it. How about this, right? So carrying a giant photoreceptor on your back. This is the next thing that I want to work on, in fact. And what I did was... I bought a backpack with a solar cell on the back of it, right? So ideally, what you'd do is you'd interface to the outputs on this solar cell in this backpack to an amplifier and a digital recorder in the backpack. You'd walk around looking for natural reflective conditions, and you'd catch audio on your back wherever you went. Just snarfing people's audio, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, this, I'm, so I'm donating this to Anycon. And um, I think Tyler's going to make it one of the prizes for, I don't know if it's the CTF or whatever, but it could be yours, um, depending on how he wants to give it away. So cool backpack, cool threat. All right, a couple other things before we conclude here. I'm running a little ahead. The smartphone as a photoreceptor, or as the receiving side of a, of a photophone. Uh, in fact, where is my phone? I wanted to show you this. Bear with me. The smartphone poses a really, really interesting platform in this regard. I'm going to show you something called Light Detector, which basically outputs, it's not outputting the real audio that's encoded in light, but it outputs audio that's associated with the amount of lux that the device is seeing. Okay, Just to show you what a smartphone uh, light sensor can do. You hear that? So that's that's based on the light sensor in a smartphone, interestingly. Okay? If you can do that with a smartphone, you can build a photophone receptor out of a smartphone using the light, the light uh, receiver on it. Um, and so that's a really interesting area of research that I'd like to undertake myself. Um, Okay, and in my opinion, after experimenting a little bit with the light with the light sensor on a smartphone, I think that we could probably recreate the entire photophone platform using smartphones alone. 
And then lastly, uh, Li-Fi. Does anyone know about Li-Fi? You do? I want to talk to you, man, because I don't know anything. I mean, I, I know a little bit about it, but it's super interesting to me. Yeah, Li-Fi is really, really cool. It's, it's basically networking data transfer via light, via LEDs, okay? Um, so Li-Fi is fascinating to me in terms of this passive reception of, of modulated light because um, I'm pretty sure that I can write something up that'll use TCP, for instance, um, to tweak the LED on a, um, a webcam, right? And encode that LED with data so that someone on the far end could pull out their smartphone with their light sensor, right, and pull the data out of that LED and it's all being done remotely. I mean, that's the essence of, of Li-Fi, right? That is the essence of Li-Fi. It's just Li-Fi poses such an interesting um, side channel in terms of transferring data to people who, let's say, you don't want them, you don't want the authorities to know. Uh, Li-Fi is a great way to do it, particularly if you can if you can do it remotely, if you can modify LEDs remotely. Um, do you know, it, it, can you modify an LED? Can you make an LED pulse, for instance, without having these special Li-Fi uh, bulbs and things that you need to buy? Can I do this remotely? Do you know? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to try it, hopefully soon. Um, all right, and so also Li-Fi, you can, you can hard code bulbs to contain data. So as you can imagine, from an espionage standpoint, it's really interesting what, what Li-Fi is opening up to the com these communities because you could take a bulb, for instance, the third bulb in a park, right, and have it output some sort of data, and then you could tell your agent X, hey, go to the park and walk up to the third light bulb and decode what's on it, right? And then go home and you've got your special instructions. Now the interesting part about that is that you can then wipe your trail, if you're handling a, a spy situation like that, you can then wipe your trail with a BB gun, <laughs> right? <laughs> So you, you've got specially encoded light bulbs, and you're and you're and you're sending you're sending out instructions. And then if you if you if the jig is up, right, you go out with a BB gun and just shoot the trail of whatever you were you were setting up. So, um, okay, that so that actually concludes this. But I would imagine there might be some questions. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yes. Laser. Laser. So, like I said, laser is so much more high fidelity than ambient light. Ambient light is, um, you know, pretty much the best I've been able to get out of it is what you heard with that song, basically. Um, but in my opinion, after after researching all this over the years, I think with high budgets, with higher level of expertise than I I have, right, that you'd be able to actually pull out some pretty meaningful intelligence out of reflected ambient light. Did you have a question? Yeah, just a quick question. If you are able to hear off of a window, would you be able to also project back sound to a window or to a source? So such as if somebody there was a window here, could somebody be able to project sound into it? That's a really fascinating question and I've never thought about it. So you're saying you'd have to have some stuff fill a receptor or something in the room that will be Yeah, you, yeah, so you're saying you take a, a light beam, you modulate it at the beginning, right? And then it hits the window. And are you catching it where it reflects to? It's not gonna, I, I don't think it's gonna vibrate the window. I think it works in the opposite direction. I think the physical medium modifies and modulates the light beam. Yes. So I would say that if you involve if you involve the physical medium as the reflector itself and you're catching it again after it bounces off, it's the same exact concepts, right? So you could modulate it at the beginning and that modulation as far as I I know would in fact propagate to the whatever reflective point it was. Um on the other hand, I don't think that the 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 window itself could be modified via the light beam unless it's strong enough. Yes. I haven't. I haven't. So, 
if I if I had uh, all the time I wanted, I would love to. I would love this to be my life, right? This this type of research, but it, it's not. Um, so I haven't tried polarizing light filters, but there's all kinds of amazing stuff you can do with those too. Do you, are you familiar? Or are you experienced with polarizing light filters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can turn cameras into like naked cameras with polarizing light filters. Yes. Oh, okay. So, right. So, uh, the conditions, I can tell you about the conditions that I've caught audio using laser listening devices. Ambient reflected light, it's a lot closer. So what I did was the, the, the pane of glass that I was vibrating with the song was, probably four to five feet away from the sound source. Laser is much different. So laser, you can if you have people just in a room and they're talking, depending on how much effort you put into your laser listening device, you can actually decode the audio off of that. So just in a room, I would say a proximity of 10 to 15 feet. Of course, the, lo the louder they are, the better, right? Um, which is why organizations like CIA, right? CIA, um, one of the buildings at the CIA, is a building within a building. So there's an air gap um, in between the two buildings. You've got a smaller building, an air gap, and then an outer shell that's all glass, right? This is specifically to defend against people bouncing infrared lasers and things off the building and being able to pull audio out of what's going on on the inside. Not only infrared lasers, but other types of waves and so forth. But they also pipe uh, white noise into that into that air gap, right? So that they're defending against any type of inbound RF slash light slash infrared, you name it, whatever spectrum, wherever you want to be on the spectrum, it's going at that CIA building. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions? Yes. Right. Okay. So the benefit of going with the commercial stuff is that that, in fact, that's where the money is because I've spent probably, uh, hours, uh, at least hours, 20 hours of my life fiddling around trying to find where a laser bounced to. <laughs> so regarding polarized filters, I think that's where polarized filters come in play and probably are built into the commercial aspects of these things because with the right filter you can in fact see an infrared beam. So I figure that on the commercial side, if you're going to spend 10 grand on a laser bounce device, it's going to come with whatever necessary filtering so you can see the beam and figure out where you need to put your receptor. But I've never had those types of resources myself. And like I said, I have spent probably 20 hours of my life trying to find a little beam, right? I mean, I can even show you how difficult this is. Don't worry, I'm not going to zap anyone in the eye. Let's find something to bounce it off of. Uh, oh, I just saw it. So, I thought I saw it. Um, oh, there's a light right there. Anyone see where that's going? It's over in the corner? Yeah. So, in this situation, as you can see, my hand is shaking. You need a tripod on this side, right? You must have a tripod on this side in order to get any type of stability. And then you need to determine where it's bouncing, right? So you find out where it's bounced. Then you need to take this little minuscule photoreceptor. It's about the size of a pencil eraser, right? And you need to, on the other side, do the same exact thing with another tripod. You need to set it up so that it's perfectly there. And then under those conditions, if someone's speaking in proximity to that light bulb, you're going to get their audio, okay? The conditions are difficult. Like I said, you spend the 10 grand, there's a reason you do it, right? It's to save yourself all that effort. Uh, yes. I so I can I can pretty much say I I don't know this for a fact, but I I can say this with high confidence. Yes. Right. <laughs> so if a, if a, if a window is is actually being vibrated by any type of outside condition, it's going to mess up the the scenario for you. Right. Um, including. Uh, you know, like weather like this today, forget it. You're not going to go surveil somebody in weather like this. Although you could do it with lasers. You're not going to do it with any type of ambient light reflection, though. Yes? How far along is the process of 
trying to get the PPPID stack to work with like uh, by product by um, just a, I would say experimental, right? Do you have any idea how you would just go about it? Because um like uh it's it's interesting the concept where there's this need to turn the electrical impulses from because that's where you're going, right? Turning the electrical impulses to the impulses within a stroke to then correspond to binary data. Yeah. Yep, but then of course, even the, even a bigger challenge. So, to, in in terms of my skill set, I find how to modulate a LED remotely over the internet probably would be easier for me to do than to figure out how to create that decoder, right, or that demodulator that you need on the other side. That's that's where I would fall over. I'd be like, oh, I need to partner with somebody who knows how to do this, like on a mo on a mobile phone or whatever. Because um, I mean, I've been playing the TCP game for a long, long time, and that's what I I liked initially, and that's what I still like. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that probably in the next couple of years we're going to see people coming out with, you know, Li-Fi exploiting technologies that are um, facilitating all kinds of cool covert communications. And as you can imagine, right, um, in terms of, I mean, think, think of this scenario. Does anyone here know what number stations are? Right, number stations are awesome. And they use a, um, a condition where, you know, you're, you're sending out, you're basically sending out a shortwave broadcast to everybody in a certain geographic or in a certain region. That in itself makes it so that whoever ultimately decodes that transmission with the one time pad, um, you don't know where they are because the transmission was sent to everybody. You don't know who it was who t dialed into that shortwave frequency, wrote down the numbers, and then decoded it because they have the OTP in their pocket, right? It's impossible to tell. Imagine this scenario in a Li-Fi scenario where uh, s uh, some government figures out a way to modify an ad on a web server, right? And that ad strobes an LED on your computer, right? And so everybody who visits that ad on, that, on a web server, they're getting an LED strobed on their computer. Every single one of them. It's the same exact concept as broadcasting something via shortwave. And then only the guy with the right device, right, to decode it and get the binary data out of it can get it. So the message is sent to everybody, and only one person has the OTP decoder. That's, that's kind of the type of experimentation I would do in that regard. Any other questions? Okay. Ah, thank you. I apologize for being under the weather, but I th you all you all bore with me, so thank you. <laughs>